Hello, my name is Chris Harris and I'm from Allery Chemistry and welcome to this video on OCRB Salters Energetics. Now this is for the oceans topic, so it's in the year two content. Um, so everything in this video is actually dedicated to the OCRB Salters topic and this is uh, one of three videos in the in the oceans topic. So it's just split up just to make it a little bit easier to, um, uh, well I suppose it breaks it down a little bit more, um, so easier to, to absorb. So this is all about energetics, this video. Um, I have done actually a full range of OCRB Salters videos um, for um, year one and year two. So they're all there on Allery Chemistry YouTube channel, um, as well as some whiteboard tutorials as well, which go through specific topics. So if you're looking for a specific uh, topic in chemistry, then the whiteboard tutorials are there. They're all for free. So all I ask is that you hit the subscribe button. That'll be absolutely fantastic just to show you support and you get any updates of new videos. And basically, as long as people keep watching them, um, and keep subscribing then I will keep making them and I'll update them for new specifications as well when they come through So like I say this is dedicated to um, the OCRB Salters topic as you can see for oceans And so therefore it's not generic um, and like where you might find some other resources online where they might be quite generic This is actually dedicated to Salters and is written around the specification as you're going to see here Okay, so in this video like I say we're going to be looking at uh, energetics so we're going to be looking at um, lattice enthalpies of form or lattice enthalpies of formation. We're going to be looking at enthalpies of hydration. We're going to be looking at calculations um, using some of the cycles um, to calculate um, enthalpy changes in these reactions. Um, we're also going to be looking at entropy as well, so delta S, um, and we're going to be looking at how we can um, classify entropy um, and look at. Finally, we're then going to look at. Um, solubility of product so we're going to be looking at that as well so there's a lot of bits of information um, in this in this video here okay so let's look at solubility first so polar solvents or polar substances can dissolve in polar solvents so what um, Salters want you to know is the um, difference between um, dissolving substances in polar solvents and non-polar solvents so how we actually dissolve them and this is critical for anything in chemistry because we need to be able to dissolve substances particularly solids into solution because they're easier to react when they're in solution we get a we get a good reaction so understanding solubility is quite an important concept within chemistry so for something to dissolve the um, the solvent bonds must break that's the first thing that must happen the substance bonds must also break as well because obviously we're adding that into our into our um, to make a solution uh, and then new bonds must be formed between the solvent and the substance now the solvent come in different types as you're going to see here in a moment so here we're going to look at polar solvents, uh, like I say, we're going to look at non-polar in a moment. But polar solvents, these are molecules that have a polarity. So classic examples are things like water, uh, because they can actually form a hydrogen bond um, uh, between um, the solvent and the substance that we're dissolving it in. Okay, So we form this aqueous, we call this an aqueous solvent, uh, and we form an aqueous solution. So some, like propanone, for example, have a permanent dipole-dipole interaction uh, and instantaneous dipole-induced dipole forces as well. So these are your non-aqueous solvents. So you can still have polar solvents, but that are not aqueous. Water is probably the most universal solvent because um, it's easy to get a hold of, it's accessible, uh, and also it's quite... Um, but well, it's not toxic, so it doesn't have any side effects, um, you know, to, to humans who are using it. So water is quite, quite an important one. So let's see how this works. So you can see here, so most ionic compounds, these dissolve in polar solvents like water. Okay, and you have your delta positive hydrogens, as you can see there. Okay, these retracted to the negative ions in our substance, which are the ones in yellow, as you can see there. And then we have our oxygen um, which has got a, a delta negative charge, as you can see on there, and that's attracted to the positive ions in the in the structure there. So remember, what happens is the bonds in these have to. Um, well, that's that's the for something to dissolve, the solvent bonds must break, um, and the substance bonds uh, must break as well. So effectively, what we're doing is you will have loads of these water molecules surrounded by each other and then inter interacting with each other. And what we're doing is we're breaking them interactions from water, and they're now being attracted to the um, substance. So let's have a look. So this is how it works. So you've got your um, ions in your substance, which break apart, as you can see there. And the water molecules actually surround the ions. And we call this hydration. And we're going to look at that a little bit more in this video as well later on. But this is the hydration process. So if it's not water, 
Um, if the if water is not used as the solvent, then we call this solvation. So, for example, if it's propanone as a, as an example, so we use that as solvation instead. So you can see here, you can see that the negative oxygens are aligned with the positive ions in this substance. This is a um, an ionic compound, as you can see there, uh, and then our delta positive hydrogens are attracted to the negative ions in our ionic compound. So for this to happen, like I say, new bonds are formed. They must be the same strength or greater than those that are broken. Um, if it's not, then our substances are actually quite unlikely to dissolve. So the new bonds here, or the interactions, should we say here, between the hydrogen and the delta negative, these must be the same strength or greater than what was required to actually break these apart. Otherwise, it won't it won't dissolve. So aluminium oxide, for example, doesn't dissolve. So Al2O3 doesn't dissolve because the ionic bonding is really, really strong. Um, and so even though it is ionic, we normally associate ionic compounds with them being you know, soluble. Um, aluminium oxide doesn't because the amount of energy required to break them apart is greater than the um, energy that's formed when, we, when the um, solvent is attracted to the uh, constituent parts of the ionic compound so aluminium oxide doesn't dissolve for that reason so very important just be wary of that there is a criteria that must be met for something to dissolve okay so polar solvents um so like i say let's have a look at these uh, polar solvents and how they dissolve so you can see here that we've got our um we've got our um, structures here so some start again some non-ionic substances can dissolve as well um, so alcohols um, dissolve in polar solvents as they can hydrogen bond with water molecules. So obviously what we looked at in the previous slide was ionic compounds breaking up. So that's how, say, ionic compounds can dissolve. But clearly alcohol is not an ionic compound. Um, so this can also dissolve, but it dissolves in a, um, in a slightly different way because it actually forms hydrogen bonding with the, uh, with the water molecule. However, there is a bit of a downside is that this bit here, as you can see circled, um, this bit here is non-polar. It's a hydrocarbon, um, and so that is non um, non-soluble. It doesn't dissolve. It can't form hydrogen bonds with your solvent, um, and so therefore, the bigger this part is, the less soluble your alcohol is. So, for example, if you've got an alcohol with five or six carbons on there, or even longer, um, you know, then this is really you know not really going to dissolve very well in water whereas your short alcohols in this case this is methanol will dissolve pretty well because there's only a small well a small section of that molecule um is actually non-polar okay so some polar molecules um don't dissolve in water so for example haloalkanes don't dissolve because their dipoles are not very strong so because there isn't much of a polarity there um it struggles to form any form of interaction with the solvent um, and water forms stronger hydrogen bonds between each other than it does with the haloalkane. Um, and so therefore, haloalkanes are actually insoluble. So you just got to remember that bit of an exception there. So just because it uh, has a polar bond or is polar doesn't mean it will automatically dissolve. So a classic example, like say haloalkanes, um, where they don't dissolve in, say, something like water because water prefers to interact with itself rather than the haloalkane. It's a bit sad really isn't it but never mind so that's what happens with haloalkanes and um, they can dissolve though in solvents that interact via permanent dipole dipole interactions so they can do that um, but they can't actually dissolve in in water as an example okay okay so there are polar so substances but we also need to know about the solubility in non-polar substances as well now non-polar substances dissolve better in other non-polar solvents okay so it's basically polar with polar non-polar with non-polar okay so non-polar solvents these are molecules that don't have a polarity so for example this would be things like alkanes um, like butane for example these only have instantaneous dipole induced dipole forces so remember these types of forces are the weakest type of forces um it's about the electron cloud um, um, um it's, it's about the, the distribution of the electrons uh, within the molecule so that's what that force is reliant upon so you don't need any kind of um electronegative element in there or any um, um mole uh, atoms such as hydrogen oxygen uh, nitrogen and and fluorine which allow um, hydrogen bonding 
So alkanes dissolve best in non-polar solvents um, as they can form instantaneous dipole induced dipole forces between the molecules. It's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it, that one? Um, you'd think they'd come up with a shorter name. They are, they are, actually, they are also known as uh, Van der Waals forces and London forces. If you do see them kind of um kind of dotted around on other sites or other other resources then it means the same thing um it's just salters prefer not to use them terms so if you do see them words it's the same force it's just given different different names okay so non-polar molecules tend not to dissolve well in water um as water forms stronger hydrogen bonds between each other than actually interacting with the non-polar molecules so that's why your um normally your alkanes they're insoluble in water for that reason because water is more than happy just interacting with itself rather than um interacting with um with non-polar solvents like like your alkanes okay so you don't need to know a lot about that other than the fact that non-polar substances dissolve better in non-polar solvents okay so what we're going to do now, we've looked at a little bit to do with solubility and we're going to kind of dip in and out of solubility throughout this video, to be honest, um, because this video is all about um, enthalpy and bond enthalpies and dissolving substances. So we're going to dip in and out. So um, there's going to be a lot of this, uh, a lot of this, a little bit more of this. But what we're going to do now is we're going to look at a little bit more in a micro detail um, and we're going to be looking at lattice enthalpy. So lattice enthalpy is the uh, measures the size of ionic bond strength. Okay, so energy is released when gaseous ions come together to form a giant ionic lattice, and this lattice is held together by these electrostatic forces. Remember, these are um, uh, forces of attraction between these oppositely charged ions. You've got a positive and a negative ion, as you can see there. So there's a there's a forces between each of them. But you can see these arrange themselves in a nice, neat pattern where effectively this positive ion here is got a negative above, a negative below, a negative left, a negative right. There's a negative just behind there, as you can see. And obviously we've cut it off at this point, but there'll be a negative in front of there. So it's perfectly aligned where it's surrounded by opposite charged ions. So it's very happy, obviously, in this structure here. But what we're saying is lattice enthalpy is basically the energy that's required to form this structure. Now, the fixed um, uh, the, the fixed criteria is that it's formed from gaseous ions. Okay, so when we take the ions that make up that, and they're in the gas phase, and theoretically speaking, um, then how much energy is required to take them gaseous ions and put them all together to form that giant structure there. So that's what we're talking about here. Um, and like I say, we give the um, a standard uh, definition here, which you do need to know. So this is the standard lattice enthalpy. So this is the enthalpy change when one mole of an ionic compound is formed from its gaseous ions under standard conditions. And your standard conditions are uh, 298 Kelvin and 100 kilopascals. Okay, so standard room temperature and pressure. So you can see here as an example, you can see to form calcium chloride, we need calcium Ca2+, plus, which is a gas, very important to include your state symbols there, 2Cl-, minus, obviously a gas, and that forms calcium chloride solid. So this is, uh, well, there will be solids because we're forming a, an ionic compound. So um, under these standard conditions, of course. So this is calcium chloride solid that's been, that's been formed there. Okay. Right. So. The standard lattice enthalpy is always negative. Energy is released as bonds are formed. So when we're forming these bonds, energy is always released. Remember, so bond formation, making or bond making, energy is released. If you're breaking bonds, energy is, is required. So that's an endothermic process. So this process is an exothermic one. And so the more negative the lattice enthalpy value is, the stronger the bonding in the compound. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to come back to that a little bit later on in the video and look at the criteria of that. Um, but what we're going to do, I'm just going to focus on the calculation side and looking at the cycle for this first, and then we'll come, we'll revisit that that element about the size of the iron, um, you know, the size of the charge and the actual uh, radius of the iron as well. We'll look at that later. So um, we're not just going to leave it there. So like I say, we're going to be looking at loads of different parts in this video. Okay, so we're going to look at something called enthalpy change of solution and hydration. So what we've looked at there is the lattice enthalpy of formation. So we're forming our lattice from ions in the gaseous state. So what we're also going to look at, because we're talking about solubility, and like I said before, we are going to be looking at a lot of this throughout this video. But because we're looking at solubility, then we need to understand about the enthalpy changes of solution and the enthalpy changes of hydration too. So the enthalpy of solution, that's 
delta sol H, that's how we'd write it, is the enthalpy change when one mole of an ionic substance, okay, is dissolved in the minimum amount of solvent to ensure no further enthalpy change is observed upon further dilution. So infinitely dilute solution. So what we're trying to say here is that basically we, we're measuring the energy change when we take a an ionic substance that could be say sodium chloride like salt for example and we're going to add the tiniest we're going to try and get away with using the minimum amount of solvent to dissolve that um, substance okay so it's in other words we've got a really concentrated solution okay so it's the minimum amount that we can get away with and what we're doing is measuring the energy change when that happens okay so to put that into kind of lay terms i suppose uh, right so Remember, for a substance to dissolve, substance bonds must break. So that's an endothermic process, okay? Um, and then new bonds are formed between the solvent and the substance, and this is an exothermic process, okay? So this is going to come quite relevant when we're looking at the cycles later on, okay? So here we are. We've got our ionic lattice in solid form. We're going to react that this time with a, with a polar solvent. So this is water, as you can see there, okay? Now, what happens, the first thing, this is in theory, so the first thing what I have to do is break all of the ions apart. So that's what's going to happen here. So we've got free moving ions. Remember, energy is required to do that. We need to put energy in to break that giant lattice up. And then what happens is the water solvent um, then um, is attracted to the individual ions, as we've seen before. And these ions are what we call hydrated. Again, we've mentioned this before. Okay, So this is where we've got two steps, breaking of the giant ionic structure and then the formation of interactions between your solvent and your um, now kind of detached or broken up ions. Okay, So the enthalpy of hydration, Okay, we've looked at the enthalpy of solution, which is this bit here. The enthalpy of hydration is the enthalpy change when one mole of aqueous ions, okay, which is this here, these are aqueous ions, okay, are formed from gaseous uh, from gaseous ions. So, for example, we've got K plus gas forming K plus aqueous, okay? So, if these ions were in a gas phase, then this would be the enthalpy of hydration, okay? So, be really, really careful. You need to know the definitions and the difference between enthalpy of solution, okay, and enthalpy of hydration. So, you're going to look at the cycles later. We're going to look at that and see how these actually interlink. So, an important summary, enthalpy change of solution is the net effect when dissolving, uh, when something dissolves. So, this involves lattice enthalpy and enthalpy of hydration, okay? So, you can see here that we've got um, this process here. Basically, it's where we break it apart. So, that's energy is required. So, that's an endothermic process. And this is an exothermic process. So, if this process here is releases more energy than is required to break this up then the net effect is overall exothermic okay so that's really important that's what we mean by that that bit at the bottom there okay okay so let's apply a little bit of calculation to this um so enthalpy change of solution can be calculated from knowing the lattice enthalpy okay and the enthalpy of hydration. So we're taking all of these concepts that we've seen already and we're going to kind of pull them together and try and use it. Basically, you make something useful out of it. And we're going to do a bit of calculation. It wouldn't be chemistry without a calculation. So we've got to do one, haven't we? I know they might not be popular. but um, So I'm going to try and break this up as best the best way I can. I'm going to use the same diagrams that we'd seen in the previous slide just to try and visualize this. Okay. So this is a little bit like a Hesse cycle. It's not it's not exactly the same. Okay. Because Hesse cycle is looking for enthalpy of formation, enthalpy of combustion. But the process or the principle of the cycle I'm going to use. I'm going to use the spirit of the cycle to kind of help show what's happening here. Okay. So what I've done here is I've written down um uh, we've written down lithium chloride. This is our solid substance. So I've drawn the diagram. There it is there. It's not broken down at all. And this is the enthalpy of solution. Remember what we said here is, is the uh, taking the solid ionic compound when this is broken up into aqueous ions that we've seen in the previous slide. So this is the enthalpy of solution here. Lithium plus aqueous and Cl minus aqueous. So we've just seen that previously. So what we're going to do, remember it happens in two steps. Okay, so we need to break them ions apart first, and then form our, uh, and then our um, solvent then surrounds the individual ions of the constituent ions. So the first thing we have to do is break the the ions first. So here it is here. 
So again, I'm using um, I'm using the the diagram here. So this is the um, lattice enthalpy of dissociation. So remember, we'd seen lattice enthalpy of formation. Okay, so this is it here. So this is breaking it up. So it's a minus figure. That's why it's minus in front of that. Okay, so this is the breaking up of the ions. So there's energy is required to. This is an exothermic process. So energy is required to actually break these ions into the individual parts, as you can see on there. Okay. And then what we have to do is then the ions are then surrounded by the solvent. So in this case, we're going to use a polar solvent. So this is water. So this is the enthalpy of hydration, which is this bit. And this then forms the individual ions are then surrounded by, as you can see, the water molecules there. So effectively, all we've done is we've broken it up into them two steps. We break it up into the individual ions first, and then we form the ions with the water surrounding it. So we're just going via a, um, like an intermediate step here instead of going from here and straight to there. So remember the enthalpy of hydration is the change when one mole of uh, aqueous ions are formed from one mole of gaseous ions. So remember that. So that's definitely the enthalpy of hydration. Okay. So the assumptions we make, remember, is we break the solid lattice up first into its gaseous ions. So that's what we've done there. Um, and then we dissolve the gaseous ions in water. So that's the enthalpy of hydration. Okay, so just as long as you're aware of that. So remember, when we go with the arrow, this is where the spirit of Hesse cycle comes out. So when we go with the arrow, we keep the sign the same. And when we go against the arrow, we change the sign. Now, you will be given data in the exam to calculate this. So don't worry too much about this. Okay, so... Um, let's have a look. Let's have a look at some figures. So we can see here, we want to work out. Now, I use a, a method, and you might have seen this already, but um, I use a method where I um, imagine it as a roadblock. If you've seen any of my other videos, you'll know I use this one. So I live in Morpeth. Um, so Morpeth is in Northumberland, uh, and the nearest city is uh, Newcastle. So I can get Newcastle either via the A1 or via the A19. Okay, A19 is longer, the A1 is much more di direct to get to the city centre. Okay, so um, let's imagine that the route via the A1, Morpeth to Newcastle via the A1, is this route here. It's the most direct route, so I can go from here to here. Now, this is where I want to be. I want to be in this location here. Okay, but imagine if that road was blocked. There's a roadblock, there's an accident, as there normally is, to be fair. Um, so let's imagine there's an accident there and I have to take a diversion. So I have to go down the A19, which is longer. So this is a little bit like how I would treat Hesse cycle. I'm still going to the same location. I'm just taking a, an alternative route, a different route. Okay, but the, the location place is the same. So this is a bit like Hesse cycle. So the bit that you want to work out, which is this bit here, what we assume is we want to get from here to here. That's where we want to go. But we assume that this road is closed. This is anything you want to work out in Hesse cycle. Assume that's the route that's closed. Okay, so we put a cross there. We say we can't go that way. So the alternative way is to go down here. So via this place and then to our final destination. So this is a little bit like the A1. Okay, so the A1 is this direct route. But because that's closed, I have to go down the A19. So I have to go uh, past Cramlington. Um, which is a town um, just in south of Northumberland, and then back into Newcastle, so swing back round to get back to where I need to be. So this is the same with Hesse cycle. So instead of going via this route here, I need to go down here, okay, so with the arrow, so this is a, um, a negative value, negative delta lattice enthalpy, whatever that value is that they've given you, so lattice enthalpy here. So because we're breaking it up, it's a negative value, okay. So we're going to put minus, minus 846, so because that's going with the arrow, we keep that minus there, so that's why that figure's there, okay. And then we're going to go with the arrow with the next one. Um, now the figures that we've been given, you'll be given these numbers, lithium is minus 519 kilojoules per mole, chlorine or Cl minus is minus 364, we've got one of each so the total is minus 883 and that's what we've put down there at the bottom. So then we put them numbers into our calculator and we should get an enthalpy of solution of minus 37 kilojoules per mole. So that's fine because you're not really going to get a massive change. You're going to get a small change in enthalpy, but it's not going to be massive in this case. So um, so it's an exothermic process. That's fine. And you'll know that one way to check this as well is if I put minus 37 in the top there and if I put in all the numbers here, 
following this rule here, when we go with the arrow, we go the same. Against the arrow, we change it. So even if I start there, I go against the arrow here, against the arrow, and with the arrow, all of their numbers should add up to zero. That's a key check there. If it doesn't, something's gone wrong. You haven't got your answer right. So just go back and check. It's absolutely worth a little bit of time just to check that because it gives you that peace of mind to make sure you've got it right. Okay. Right, so now we're going to look at some energy level diagrams, okay? So we can calculate enthalpy change of solution using an energy level diagram. So remember, we're going to use the same principle. It's going to look a little bit different, this type of diagram. But we're going to, when we go with the arrow, um, we keep the sign the same. And when we go against the arrow, we change the sign. So this is just going to be a little bit different. Similar to Hester cycle though, but just kind of designed, designed in a slightly different way. So you see we've got our data here. So you'll all be always be given this. So don't panic about it. If you're looking at thinking, Craig, how am I supposed to remember that? You will be given this data, of course. So enthalpy of hydration of Cl minus is minus 364. The enthalpy of hydration of Mg2 plus is minus 1920. And the lattice enthalpy of magnesium chloride is minus 2526. So we've got our enthalpy values there. And what I've done on the right here is I've drawn a cycle out. Okay, and the cycle is just showing them different steps. Remember, there's three different steps that we need to know. So we've got one, two, and three. And we've drawn it, it's an energy level diagram because effectively the higher these lines are, the higher the energy. So this is the highest energy, this is the lowest energy. So what we've got here is magnesium chloride solid, that's our solid uh, substance. We've got our gaseous ions at the top here and our aqueous ions at the bottom. And we've set it out in a cycle like this, as you can see. So what we're going to do is basically going to use this cycle, this energy level diagram, to try and work out the enthalpy change of solution, okay, using this diagram, using the same principle as Hess's cycle, okay. So enthalpy change of solution, remember, is this step here. So it's going from the solid compound, as you could see there, to um, ions, which are aqueous or aqueous ions. So let's work this out. So our last enthalpy change is that bit there. And our enthalpy of hydration is obviously on the side there. Okay, so we need to calculate the enthalpy of solution, which is magnesium chloride, MgCl2. So this is the bit that we need to work out. So what I've done is I've just put that bit there. Okay, so the enthalpy of solution is magnesium chloride, solid, um, and that's obviously what we're trying to work out here. So we're going to use that same analogy. I'm not going to... Obviously, I've just gone through it there. So I'm going to use the same analogy of Morpeth to Newcastle, how I actually get there, either A1 or A19. So we're going to use the same principle here. So I need to start from here. This is like Morpeth, and I need to get to here, which is Newcastle. So this is the route that I'm going to take. This is the A1, this one. This is the most direct route, okay? But imagine that that's blocked, so I need to take a diversion. So I need to go up here and then down here, so I need to take a different route. I'm ultimately ending up in the same place, whoops, sorry, I'm ultimately ending up in the same place, which is there, um, but um, I have to take a diversion, as you can see. So, as you see there, just before, because I was a bit, bit keen on the on the mouse there, um, what we have to do is we have to work out or put the values in of this value here and this value here, and thankfully we've got this data here. So the first one is to work out the lattice enthalpy change. Now, we have that. Um, the lattice enthalpy change, remember this is minus, okay, so this is the, because this is the formation, lattice enthalpy is the formation of this, but because we're going to form ions, we put a minus in front of it, remember what we said before, so this is going to be minus, minus 2526, okay, which is this bit here, so, because um, it's the opposite of that, so effectively it's positive, plus 2526, it means the same thing, um, so that's for that arrow, okay, um, and then, so there we are, okay, because we're going against the arrow, remember here, so we, we put a minus in front of it, okay. So um, let me just go through that again to make it a bit clearer. Um, so you see this bit here where you've got your magnesium 2 plus, because I think I don't, don't think I made myself clear enough there, so I'm going to just go through it again. So you see this magnesium 2 plus, which is a gas, and chloride ion, which is a gas. So these are gases. Now this arrow here, going down this arrow here, is forming magnesium chloride. So we're forming, going from gaseous ions to form a solid complex. So a, co a solid compound, sorry. So this here, this step going downwards, this down arrow, is called the lattice enthalpy of magnesium chloride. So this here is negative. This is minus 2526 going this way. But because we're starting here 
and we need to go up here and then down here to get to our end spot which is down here we need to go against the arrow so now because we're going against the arrow we have to change the sign so instead of it being minus 2526 it's going to be plus 2526 so that minus and a minus is effectively the same as plus 2526 okay because we're going against the arrow so we change the sign Okay, so that just to make that a little bit clearer, you can just put plus 2526. To be honest, I should have done that because I think it makes it a little bit clearer. Okay, so it's plus 2526 with that one. And then we're going with the arrow here. So this is going to be the enthalpy of hydration of Mg2 plus, okay, which is mi minus 1920. We only need one of them, as you can see here. So we've got the value there, so that's fine. So we're going to put that in there. Okay, and then also you notice that we've got chlorine as well, but we have two of them. So don't forget to do that. So we've got two lots of Cl minus. So it's two times minus three, six, four, which is that one there. Again, we're going with the arrow. So we keep the sign the same. So it's minus seven, two, eight. So we're going to put that in there as well. So there it is. So now we've got all our different parts. We literally just put that into your calculator uh, and we should get a value of minus 122 kilojoules per mole. Again, just the same as Hess's cycle, um, you know, put all your numbers in. So this number that you've got here, which is the enthalpy of solution, this one here, put that there, just put it there, um, and then put all your numbers in. And then remember, if you go with the arrow, you keep the sign the same. If you go against the arrow, you change the sign. So just go through it all the way around the cycle until you end up where you started with, where you started from, um, and then they should all add up to zero. Okay, so just a quick check, just to make sure that um, that works. Okay. So that's the energy level diagram. So what we're going to do now, obviously this is looking at enthalpy changes um, on, a, on a very kind of micro scale. So what we're going to do now is going to look at it on a practical scale. How do we actually measure um, these enthalpy changes of these solutions? And so what we're going to do is look at a method called calorimetry, which you may have seen before. Don't get this confused with colorimetry. Um, which looks at uh, color changes. This is calorimetry. So calories, energy, okay, energy change. So Energy from a calorimetry experiment can be calculated. Um, and you might have seen this equation before, but just as a recap, this is how we work out the energy change in a, in a reaction. So we use Q equals MC delta T, where Q is the heat energy lost or gained, depending on what that is. And that's in joules. M is the mass of solution. Okay. C is the specific heat capacity of water, which is 4.18 joules per grams per Kelvin. You will be given that number, so don't worry about that. And T is the temperature change in Kelvin. Okay, um, If it's in degrees Celsius, the temperature change in degrees Celsius is the same as the temperature change in degrees Kelvin. You just need to make sure you're using the, the units of Kelvin, though. Okay, But the change is the same. So if it's a change of 10 degrees Celsius, that is 10 degrees Kelvin. So don't worry too much about that. Okay. Okay, so let's have a look at how this actually can be worked out practically. Okay, so energy from calorimetry experiments of solutions can be calculated. Now, you might have seen an experiment where you use a, a spirit burner, so you use a fuel, and we're using that uh, to heat up a, a copper can. You've got a copper can above, uh, and we're using that to measure the temperature rise of the water, and that tells us the amount of energy, the energy change in the fuel. This is a slightly different experiment that we're not using a spirit burner. We're just mixing two solutions together in a polystyrene cup, or it could be two. It could be a solid in a solution. It doesn't really matter, but we've got a solution there. Um... Um, and we're going to measure the energy change or the enthalpy change of a uh, of a reaction, okay, in this example. So here, instead of a copper can, we have a polystyrene cup. And the polystyrene cup is to prevent heat loss. Another way of preventing heat loss is using, um, uh, sorry, um, is using, let me just go back, uh, is using a lid, which is on here, as you can see. So any heat change in this reaction as a consequence, whether that's dissolving something, could be solution, um, so dissolving a solid compound in here, or whether it's reacting two liquids together to see an enthalpy change, then what we want to do is measure the energy change within this. We don't want that escaping out to the surroundings. So polystyrene cup adds to insulation, and the lid obviously prevents heat loss as well. Okay. So what we're going to do is add our liquid first and we're going to measure the temperature of the reaction. So we add our liquid first and then we measure it. And then what we're going to do in this case, we're going to add a solid and we're going to measure the enthalpy change and when we dissolve a solid in the, in the, in the solvent here. So we add a solid, we stir um, and measure the temperature change. So we measure the temperature of the liquid first 
and we take normally you would do it say three times you wait three minutes to make sure you get a good amount and then we say on the fourth minute sometimes it might be the fifth minute it really doesn't matter and um, then we add our powder and then we, what we do is you measure the temperature thereafter you know after so we wait a minute after adding the powder and then we start and measure the temperature okay so let's have a look at an example so we've got 11.1 grams of sodium chloride so that's our salt was dissolved in 100 centimeters cubed of water with a temperature of 20 degrees celsius and this raised the temperature to a maximum of 26 degrees celsius so that was the maximum it it, it rose by eventually it cooled obviously over time but the maximum it rose was 26 so we need to calculate the enthalpy of solution of sodium chloride okay so let's have a look at the first one so remember our equation which is q equals mc delta t okay so q equals m so this is <coughs> excuse me um so this is the mass of water which is 100 grams as you can see there because it told us that we had 100 centimeters cubed of water so we assume that the density is um is one gram per centimeter cubed so we just say it's 100 grams so that's fine and um, that's a fair assumption to make unless they state otherwise of course 4.18 is the heat capacity which is c and then six is your change in temperature so we know this is degrees celsius but the change in degrees celsius is the same as the change in kelvin okay so we should get a value of 2508 joules or 2.508 kilojoules so that's the energy remember that's very different from enthalpy enthalpy is kilojoules per mole energy is just kilojoules okay so because we've worked out our energy we now need to work out enthalpy and to work out enthalpy we need to know moles so that's what we're going to do so we're going to work out the number of moles of our solid okay which is sodium chloride so that's what we've added there so the number of moles is mass divided by mr okay so remember the enthalpy change of solution is when one mole of solute dissolves in water okay and so we need to work out the number of moles of sodium chloride as a result so this is why okay so the mass is 11.1 because that's the mass that we've been given and the mr is 58.5 so use your periodic table to work that out and the number of moles is 0 0.190 okay so that's the number of moles there so now we've got the number of moles we can then work out the enthalpy so the enthalpy change remember is the energy divided by the number of moles so there it is so enthalpy is energy divided by moles so we get 2.508 because that's the amount in kilojoules divided by 0 0.190 and we get an enthalpy change of 13.2 kilojoules per mole which is there okay so the enthalpy of solution though may differ from the actual values found in the data book and this might be because <coughs> excuse me okay so this might be because of heat loss to the surroundings so you can see here um that if we didn't you know if, if some of the heat was lost to here then we wouldn't get the similar value to what we get in the data book quite an important point because they may actually ask you that okay <coughs> excuse me let me just take a drink okay okay excuse me okay so so that's how we work it out using using calorimetry okay so now what we're going to do is we're just going to kind of come back and just finish this little bit off before we then look at uh we look at entropy um so we're going to look at um obviously we've looked at enthalpy changes practically and we've looked at enthalpy changes in terms of the cycles and we've looked at all that bit so what we're going to do is we're going to just look into the final bit of lattice enthalpy and um, like i say before we look at entropy so um remember what we said before that one of the factors to do with um the energy change was the size of the ion and the size of the charge okay so this is where we're going to look at it in a little bit more detail and you are expected to give an explanation behind that so this is where we're going to look at that so the size of the charge in the ion affects the strength of the ionic bond and obviously that affects the enthalpy changes that we've just discussed before so the bigger the charge in the ion the stronger the electrostatic between the ions that kind of makes sense doesn't it so if you've got a two plus and a two minus you know they're going to attract each other much more strongly than just a one plus and a one minus because you've got bigger charges there okay so they're, they're much bigger so more energy is required to overcome these forces and so therefore they actually have higher melting and boiling points as a, as a consequence um and so therefore the energy change um is going to be higher so let's look at an example here so you've got KCl is made of K plus and Cl minus and has a melting point of 770 degrees Celsius. Whereas calcium oxide is made from a 2 plus and a 2 minus and the amount of energy required to break that apart is going to be um, 
2572 degrees celsius so it's useful using things like melting and boiling points because when we're um obviously when we're melting these solids we have to break the ions up and this has given us a good indication as the energy you know the energy differences between the different size ions so that's why we're talking about um the melting points here Okay, so the other one is the size of the ion as well. So that's the ionic radii, and that affects the strength of the ionic bond as well. So the smaller the ion, the stronger the electrostatic attraction between the ions. So remember, um, you know, if the if the ions are smaller, these can then pack much more closely together, and so therefore more energy is required to overcome these um, these forces that are holding these ions together and so therefore the melting and boiling points you can use the same measurement here and um, must be higher because more energy is required to break them ions apart okay so let's have a look at an example here so for example sodium chloride is made from na plus and cl minus ions um, so these have a melting point of this has a melting point of 801 degrees celsius um, whereas um, uh, kcl so potassium, potassium chloride. So potassium is a bigger, um, is a is a is a bigger ion than sodium. So it's lower down the periodic table in that group one. So it was made from K plus and Cl minus. So we're just using a bigger ion, but that was a lower melting point of 770 because less, you know, they can't pack together as much, and so therefore the forces aren't quite as strong. Okay. So generally. So as a general rule, the smaller the ion and the higher the charge, the stronger the electrostatic attraction, and hence the higher the um, the melting point is for these substances. So and therefore more energy is required. So it's exactly the same principle for when we're dissolving them in solution as well. And so therefore what we can say is they have a high charge density. Okay, so these are the key words that you need to be using in the exam. Obviously we're using temperature here because it's easy to measure this practically. But the same principle applies when we're dissolving it in solution. We have to break these ions apart first. And you know, depending on these factors here will depend on how well these are actually uh, bonded together. Okay, and how much energy is required to break them apart. Okay, so we're going to look at entropy change of hydration. So we've looked at the other one. So this is going to be the, the final bit before we look at entropy, like I say. So there's two things that can affect the enthalpy change of hydration. So that's the charge and the size of the ion, as we've seen before. So we're just bringing this back in into the concepts that we've seen already. So charge, so ions with a higher charge attract water molecules more strongly as the electrostatic attraction is stronger. So this is, remember this step is when we've broken up the ions first. Remember we, in, the, in theory, we look at the two steps. We break the ions first. So we looked at that in the previous slide about how much energy is required to break the ions in the first place but then what we have is the solvent is then attracted to them individual ions once it's broken and so this is called the enthalpy of hydration so this is what we're looking at here it's the you know what affects that bit there so the bit where the the solvent is attracted to the ions so this is what was this is this this is this bit here just to put it to a bit of context so more energy is released um, when the bond um, is made which means they have a more exothermic enthalpy of hydration so the larger the charge the greater the enthalpy of hydration kind of makes sense okay so you've got a, a two plus charge is going to form a much stronger interaction with the solvent than a one plus charge and vice versa if it was a negative charge as well the size as well has an impact so smaller ions have a higher charge density so remember that word that we used from the previous slide um, much higher charge density than larger ones. These attract these water molecules or whatever solvent it is. We're going to use water because it's the universal solvent. These attract them much more strongly. So there's much more of an exothermic uh, enthalpy of hydration with these types of, um, in this type of situation with a smaller size. So the, the general rule is the smaller the ion, the greater the enthalpy of hydration. So this is looking at, for example, sodium and potassium. So sodium is a smaller ion compared to a potassium ion, so therefore it's going to have a much stronger attraction between the solvent um, than, um, uh, than the potassium one is. So you can see here, just to kind of put this into a diagrammatic form, um, you can see here that we've got a 1 plus, uh, a one plus ion, which is larger. So this is a larger um the, the charge density is is lower sorry in this one so we've only got a one plus charge so there isn't many 
Um, there isn't many attractions. I've just symbolized this by the number of water molecules. So you can see here the attractive forces. They're not attracting as many water molecules here. Whereas a 2 plus charge, which is smaller, as you can see there, there's a lot more. Um, there's a lot bigger attraction here between the water molecules and the iron. So this one's going to be more exothermic compared to this one here. So the size of the charge and the size of the iron, they're the two things which have an impact on um, the enthalpy of hydration, how exothermic that is going to be. Okay, so there's a lot of information there. So there's a lot to do with um, solubility and dissolving things in solution um, regarding, um, regarding this one. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at entropy and then we're briefly going to come back to solutions right at the end of the video as well. Okay, so let's look at entropy first. Okay, so entropy is a funny thing. Now, if, you've, um, if you're watching this for the first time uh, or you haven't seen this topic before and you're lo looking at this as a bit of a head start, um, then entropy may seem a little bit bizarre, bizarre uh, but it's all about the it's the measure of disorder in a system. Okay, so it's another form of energy. So all the energies we've been looking at just before are enthalpy changes. So this is to do with something's endothermic or exothermic. So entropy is another form of energy. Okay, except we're measuring disorder in a system rather than. Um, bond formation and bond breaking okay so this is more to do with the arrangement of atoms so entropy is given the letter s yes it's a bit strange but they give the letter s uh, it's the number of ways energy can be shared out between particles okay so the more disorder there is the higher the level of entropy okay so just to kind of strip this back so it's really simple and it is the principle is really straightforward the calculation is a little bit tricky but we'll look at them in a moment but we're going to look back at solids, liquids, and gases. I bet you never thought we we're going to talk about this at air level. But yes, we're going to look at solids, liquids, and gases. So you know that a solid has a regular arrangement, tightly packed together, as you can see in there. A liquid still tightly packed together, but they have a much more random arrangement. And a gas has a lot of space in between the particles, and they move around randomly, um, you know, as and when as and when they can. They fill the space of the of the box that they're in, the container that they're in. So as you can see here, in terms of particles and in terms of entropy. Gases are more disordered, okay, than solids are. So solids have a lot more order to them. Liquids are a little bit more disordered. There's no kind of a regular arrangement with liquids. And gases kind of do what they want. There's loads of space there. So therefore, gases are the most disordered way in which you can arrange an atom. There's more ways in which you can arrange the atoms in this formation than there is in this. And so what this means is you have actually an increase in entropy. So you have more entropy here with this because there's more ways in which you can arrange the atom than you can with a solid okay so gases are the most disordered entity and so the number of particles also affects entropy change as well so if we have a reaction for example that's um um that, that all the reactions are in the same state but there's more moles are produced as a product so for example you might have two moles on the left we'll look at an example in a moment um, so you might have two moles on the left and four moles on the right, then there's more moles being produced, then this is also an increase in entropy. There's more ways in which the energy can be distributed. Okay, so look at an example. So here we've got dinitrogen tetroxide producing nitrogen dioxide. This is showing an increase in entropy. They're all in the same state, so there's no state change here. They're both, they're both gases, but we have more moles on the right than we do on the left. So this is an increase in entropy. So um, there is more ways in which there's more particles effectively on the on the right hand side there. Okay. Um, this is a little bit like the best way to kind of describe this entropy is a bit like if you have a, a bedroom. Now um, it takes. Um, you know, everything in nature has a tendency, generally, um, to, uh, or, well, it does, it tends towards more disorder, okay? So it's lower in energy. So particles which have higher entropy are lower in energy. That's a that's a favorable position to be in. So if you think about your bedroom, it's more easier. It's easier, it takes less energy to make it a mess than it does to tidy that up. So if you have stuff all around the place, okay it takes a lot longer and a lot more energy to put everything back into a particular order okay but there's always a tendency for things to kind of um move down into um into a um a more favorable position in other words a gas or with more moles okay so that's what we're looking at with entropy so the amount of energy which is quanta in if you do physics you might have heard this already um but the amount of energy or quanta a substance has affects entropy so the more energy 
Uh, the more energy, the more ways particles can be arranged and therefore the greater the entropy. Okay, so this is really important. So the more ways energy can be arranged, arranged such as the gas or, for example, more moles produced, then the greater the entropy value. Okay, and that's a favorable position. Okay, so entropy change, um, which is given this uh, symbol here, so delta meaning change in system, so this is entropy of the system, this can be calculated between reactants and products in a reaction. So this is where we're going to look at some calculation involved here. So entropy change, which is uh, delta system S, is product minus reactants. Okay, so it's always product minus reactants. The units of entropy is joules per Kelvin per mole. And so what we're going to do is we're going to put these into a standard condition. Okay, so all these values here are assuming that we have one mole of substance, always, 100 kilopascals of pressure, and 298 Kelvin. Um, that's the, the temperature that we undergo these at. So let's have a look at an example, because I think the best thing, because these are just calculations, so the best thing is to see it in context. So here we're going to use um, the reaction between hydrated barium hydroxide and ammonium chloride, and we're going to calculate the uh, change in entropy here. So here's our reaction here. So when we say it's hydrated, this dot 8H2O tells us the water of crystallization. So this is the number of water molecules surrounding this barium hydroxide compound here okay we've got ammonium chloride obviously which is here and um, that's what we're reacting it with and we form ammonia water and barium chloride which is a solid okay so we're reacting these two solids together this is a pretty uh, a pretty cool reaction to be honest this one um uh you well i'll tell you in a minute i'll show you the figures first and i'll tell you in a minute okay so you can see here that we've got uh our solid and a solid and we reacted two solids together to form a gas a liquid and a solid okay so we've got our data here here's our entropy data so it's in joules per kelvin per mole notice the units there it's not kilojoules it's in joules per kelvin per mole and we have our entropy changes for each of our substances here our reactants and our products so the first thing we need to do is we need to work out the entropy change of products first so you can see here that we've got an entropy change of for ammonia um, so we've got two lots of ammonia there because we've um, uh, uh, we've got two more lots of ammonia that's been produced. We have ten lots of water, so there's the water there, uh, and then we have a barium chloride which is there. We only have one molecule of that, uh, so we have our entropy values there. So we're going to put these numbers in. So we've got two lots of one nine two because that's the amount for ammonia. We've got ten lots of water, which is seventy. And then we've got 124, which is your barium chloride there. So we add all that up and we get 1,208 joules per Kelvin per mole. Okay. So then we've got reactants, as you can see there. So reactants are barium hydroxide, which is dot H, 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 H2O. So we've got 427 for that one. Uh, and then we've got two lots of ammonium chloride, which is two lots of 95. And we get 617. So that's our entropy change for reactant. Now, you can see if we put all them numbers in, we get... 1208 minus 617 and we get an entropy change of plus 591 kilojoules per mole now this one is a positive value as you can see there so this is entropically feasible however what i can tell you and just come back into this is this reaction is incredibly endothermic okay so it's an endothermic process so enthalpically that's not feasible entropically it is but enthalpically it isn't and this reaction you might have seen it before when you mix these two solids together in a beaker they basically go really really cold and you can do this by taking a block of wood and you take a beaker with these two solid substances and now you mix these substances in the beaker and in between the block of wood and the beaker you put a drop of water in between and this reaction gets that cold that it freezes the water between the beaker and the block of wood and effectively the beaker then sticks to that wood so it's an incredibly endothermic reaction. This shouldn't go in theory because endothermic reactions, the products are higher in energy than the reactants and that's just not a favorable position. But the reason why the reaction goes at room temperature is because the entropy is so feasible. Okay, so we're looking at the feasibility of this as well. Okay, so we're looking at the kind of playoff between these. Okay, so the total entropy change, so delta total S, can be calculated using entropy changes of the system and the surroundings. So what we've looked at there is the entropy change of the system. So this is basically what's the 
the entropy change within that beaker. So now what we have to take into account is the um, the entropy of the surroundings as well. So this gives us the total entropy change. So we've seen, like I say, the system. Um, we need to um, we need to look at the surroundings because some of that energy there is actually transferred to the surroundings in that beaker. So we need to take that into account as well. So remember your entropy or the units of entropy are joules per kelvin per mole. So J, K to the minus 1, mole to the minus 1. So entropy of the uh, the total entropy change is going to be entropy of the system plus entropy of the surroundings, which are them two there. Okay, so this is um, another equation that allows us to calculate the um, the entropy change of the surroundings. So we need to know this one as well, because obviously we know how to work out the system, um, but we do need to know this element here. So we need to work out how do we actually work out that bit. And then once we've got both elements, obviously we've done that bit already, but once we've got both elements, we can then work out the total entropy change. So to work out the entropy change of the surroundings, we use this equation here. So entropy change of the surroundings is minus delta H. Remember, this is your enthalpy change. Um, and we, we convert this into joules per mole. So normally you would have entropy, uh, sorry, enthalpy change in kilojoules per mole, but you must convert to joules per mole. So you just multiply by a thousand um, to get it in joules per mole. And the temperature is obviously in Kelvin as well. Okay, so there's two more equations there that we need to know. Okay, so what we're going to do is going to calculate the total entropy change for ammonium nitrate crystals being dissolved in water to form a solution. Okay, so it seems as though we're on the theme of solution, you can see where we're going with this one. All of this is, of course, under standard conditions. Okay, so we're going to take all them equations that we've seen there and we're going to apply it to work out the total entropy change. Okay, so let's have a look at our reaction first. So there it is there. So we've got ammonium nitrate, and that will form ammonium ion plus nitrate ion. And that gives us an enthalpy change um, of plus 25.7 kilojoules per mole. So this is an endothermic reaction here because it's a positive value. Okay, we've got our entropy values here as well. We've got ammonium nitrate, which is 151. We've got ammonium, which is 113. And we've got nitrate ion, um, which is 146. So we've got our figures there. So the first thing we need to do, because we need to work out the total entropy change, is we need to work out the change in the system first. So remember how we do the system. So entropy of the system is products minus reactants. So we take the entropy of the product, which is 146 plus 113, minus 151, which is this bit here. And that gives us a total entropy change of the system of 108 joules per kelvin per mole. Okay, so we've worked that bit out. Now we need to work out the entropy change of the surroundings. Okay, so remember that equation that we mentioned before. So um, entropy of surroundings is minus uh, delta H over T. So then what we do is we take all these, all this information here. Obviously, we've got delta H, which is this value here, but it's minus delta H. So it's minus that uh, divided by the temperature. Okay, so all this is done under standard conditions. So remember, because it's standard conditions, that's 298 Kelvin. So what we do is we put all these numbers, there we are, into our into our uh, equation. But one very important thing, remember I mentioned this before, is that our enthalpy here is kilojoules per mole. We must convert that. Uh, we must convert that into um, kilo, into joules per mole. So we multiply that by a thousand. So that means the same thing times by ten to the three means the same as multiply by a thousand so that gets it into joules per mole divided by 298 if you don't do this you're going to get something that's out by a factor of a thousand so it's really really important to do that minus 86.24 joules per kelvin per mole okay so that's the the entropy change of the surroundings okay so then all you have to do is then work out the total entropy change. So obviously we've seen how to how to work that out um, just before we've seen the equation. So total entropy change, remember, is the entropy of the system plus the entropy of the surroundings. And we put all these two numbers together and we get a total entropy change of 21.76 joules per kelvin per mole. Okay, so you can see here there's quite a bit of information here. We've got to work out the entropy of the uh, surroundings, the entropy of the system, and then we've got to put all that together to use the total entropy. So there's three equations that we're using here. Okay, so just remember that. But loads of marks, just see it as loads of marks. Okay, you'll be fine. Okay, 
So the total entropy change must be positive or zero for a reaction to be feasible. So for something to actually work at standard conditions and temperature, so standard temperature and pressure, then um, the entropy, the value of that total entropy change must be positive or it must be zero. If it's negative, it means that it's entropically not favorable under them conditions. So a feasible reaction, like say, is one which will, uh, which will um, carry on, that should say carry, not K, uh, should carry on to completion without any energy being provided to it okay so you can see here we've got um our reaction remember which is entropy so the total entropy here is entropy of the system plus surrounding so basically this will just go of its own accord without any external factor being applied to it so let's have a look so magnesium carbonate decomposes to form magnesium oxide and carbon dioxide so what we're going to do is calculate the minimum temperature when this reaction is feasible okay so the minimum temperature so you can see here that we've got an entropy change here of plus 117 kilojoules per mole and we've got an entropy of the system they've given us this bit which is very kind uh, it's 175 joules per kelvin per mole so we've got this bit and we've got the entropy change okay so the minimum temperature um, is when the entropy change or the total entropy change is zero okay so what we can say is that remember the total entropy change is system plus surroundings so if the total entropy change is zero then what we can say is we can effectively get rid of that bit and we can rearrange it to say that the total entropy change of the system will equal minus entropy change of the surroundings okay so basically what we've done is we've taken out that bit we've equated that to zero okay and then what we've done is move the surroundings bit over to this side okay to have minus surroundings equals entropy of the system okay so that's what that's what we mean when we say that so the total entropy of the system remember this is the bit we need to work out is um delta h minus uh, sorry, uh, delta. So the entropy of the system, should I say here, uh, is entropy change divided by T. Okay, so that's what we that's what we're doing there. So then, what we need to do, we arrange that to give um, T equals delta H divided by delta S of the system. Okay, so we've rearranged that, and this is going to tell us the temperature or the minimum temperature for this reaction to uh, for this reaction to actually occur. Okay, so. T in this case is 117,000, uh, should I say? Because remember, what we've got to do um, is we've got to convert that into joules per mole, because this is in kilojoules, so multiply that by 1,000. So that's why that one is 117,000. Divided by 175, this is the entropy of the system, so it's this bit here. And then we put all them numbers in, and the minimum temperature here is 668 Kelvin. Okay, so that's the minimum temperature that's required for this reaction to be feasible. In other words, for this to go. And this is really useful uh, for chemists because we can actually work out in industry, we can work out, you know, what's the minimum temperatures required to make this product. If the temperature change or if the temperature is, is too low, then the reaction won't go. But if we're heating for providing too much energy or too much heat energy that's going to be wasteful if we can get away with just heating it at a lower temperature so knowing the minimum temperature allows us to you know heat our reaction with the minimum amount of energy required and that's good uh, economically for the company because they're not wasting um energy on on uh, or they're not wasting money on the energy that's not required and it's good for the environment as well because normally a lot of this energy is produced by burning fossil fuels so if we're not burning as much then there's not as much emissions Okay, so just coming on to the last bit of this video is actually what we're going to look at is um, solubility of products. So all the way through this video, we've looked at solutions and dissolving things and the energy, both enthalpy and entropy, as you can see on there, we've looked at both sides. So now what we're going to do is kind of combine all this together and just, um, and just try and uh, piece it all together and put it in one place. So solubility, remember, so we looked at the solubility, is the extent to which a solid dissolves in solution, okay? So when ionic solids are added to water, remember, hydrated ions are present in aqueous solution. So this is where you've got your constituent ions are surrounded by your water molecules. So the degree of solubility depends on the type of solid, but also the temperature and pressure. So we're bringing in a lot of different factors here, okay? 
So there will come a point when the water can no longer hold any more solid and we call this the point of saturation. Okay, so in other words, you can have your beaker of water and keep adding salt and salt and salt. You keep adding it, but you know the, the water will only hold so much salt. Okay, so no more, any additional solid won't dissolve. So that's the point of saturation. Now, the maximum amount of solid that will dissolve in a solvent is called solubility. How soluble is something? Okay, so the solubility of something. Okay, so solubility has a units of grams per decimeters cubed. Um, and is temperature dependent, so you'll see figures quoted with specific temperatures. So, for example, if we heat something up, then something might be it might, a solution may be able to hold more um, uh, more of your solid substance, your solute. Okay, if it's cooler, it might not be able to hold as much. So, the temperature does have an impact here. So, to get solubility in moles per decimeters cubed, all we do is we divide grams per decimeter cubed by the molar mass of the solid. And the molar mass is um, uh, is obviously calculated by using the um, the uh, periodic table. So we use the figures on there, okay, to work that out. So the solubility. Let's look at an example. So the solubility of barium sulfate at two hundred ninety eight Kelvin is zero point zero zero two five grams per decimeters cubed. Give the solubility in moles per decimeters cubed. So we need to convert these units. So let's have a look. So the molar mass of barium sulfate is 233.4 grams per mole. So that's using the periodic table. So just look at that. And so the solubility in moles per decimeters cubed is 0 0.025 grams per decimeters cubed divided by 233.4, which is the molar mass of that. And that gets us 1.07 times by 10 to the minus 5 moles per decimeters cubed. So that's the solubility of um, barium sulfate. Okay. So in a saturated solution, we have um, the concentration of barium 2 plus or barium ions equals the concentration of sulfate ions. So remember when we dissolve, when we add this in solution, these ions will break apart. They'll break apart, remember from the previous, earlier on in the video, they break apart. So in a saturated solution, um, we have 1.07 times by 10 to the minus 5 moles per dm cubed of these ions in a saturated solution so that's where we have something where we can't when we add more solvent to it okay um or when we add sorry when we add more solute to it it's not no further sol solute is going to dissolve okay we're at maximum saturation okay so that's what that means there so what we're going to now introduce is something called um a, a solubility constant or solubility of product and we're going to look at ks P, okay and it's a way of measuring the solubility of the product this constant here okay so an equilibrium is established when dissolved ions and undissolved solid um so an equilibrium is established sorry between dissolved ions and undissolved solid when sparingly soluble solids are dissolved in solution okay so let's have a look at this example so if we have a sparingly soluble solid so it doesn't dissolve very well okay then we have so for example we've got aa and bb as an example here um is dissolved to saturation then we have this equilibrium is established so for example this solid here breaks up into its constituent ions so we've got uh, an amount of a depending on what we've got here okay depending on how much is there um, and that has the charge of whatever the number is here for B. Okay, so that's what that bit means. Uh, and then it's the amount of B as well. These are the ions here, which has this, the same value. The charge here is the same as the number that was on A, which is down here. And obviously we have a certain amount of these depending on what the, sub, what the substance is. Okay, so that's the equilibrium that exists. It's the equilibrium between the ions and the solid. So we can apply the equilibrium constant Kc, which you may have seen already, um, Kc to show that uh, to show how this looks. So we don't include solids in this. Remember, okay? So we're only including the aqueous ions. So this is equilibrium. So solids are not included. So Kc is the concentration of A um, multiplied by the concentration of B, which is this bit here, and they're both raised to the power of whatever the value is and um, the number of moles of each so it's either a or it's b whatever that is okay so this is the equilibrium constant which is kc now ksp is the equilibrium constant for a sparingly soluble product 
in a saturated solution and it actually has the same formula as kc okay it's exactly the same but we're using this in relation to solubility so ksp is therefore exactly the same as what it is for kc we're just specifying it as a solubility of product so it's going to be a concentration of a concentration of b and obviously depending on what number of moles is in front of them will be the powers that go on the top there okay so ksp has a fixed value for a specific solution and temperature so very similar to kc okay we're just using a different we're just measuring something different okay so we're looking at an equilibrium constant but this is to do with a spare insoluble product in a saturated solution okay right so ksp should always include state symbols in the expression you must always include them at all at all times okay so using barium sulfate so baso4 as an example this is how we'd write out an expression in terms of ba2 plus and so4 2 minus um uh, iron concentrations and the solubility of barium sulfate so let's have a look so our ksp our expression is going to be this so it's ba2 plus so 42 minus you must include these state symbols here this shows that these um these ions are actually dissolved in solution we don't include the solid the solid initial product of barium sulfate okay so the ksp is this okay so this is ksp this is the solubility of barium sulfate squared okay so this is this bit here so ksp is the solubility of barium sulfate squared so as the concentration of each ion in the saturated solution equals the solubility of barium sulfate we actually square it okay so we have two of these okay so we've got that and that we have two different ions here so we have to square it here which is the solubility of bas4 so4 because this produces the two ions so therefore we must square it on the side there so that's the solubility that's how we'd write the expression for solubility of barium sulfate and so just like for kc we need to work out the units and these vary according to to the actual reaction so we work out the units of the solubility of product for um, bi2s3 okay so bismuth sulfide um so let's have a look so ksp is bi3 plus okay so remember it's the charge that was on here goes on the top there so it's bi3 plus and s2 minus the number that's on the bottom here becomes the charge for s so you can see it's s2 minus now we know that this is two and three respectively because this would dissociate to produce two bismuth ions so that's squared and this will dissociate to produce three sulfide ions which is three which is there okay so that's how we know it's that expression there so then to work out the units it's really straightforward these are obviously concentrations so it's moles per decimeters cubed so we've got two lots of that so we write it out twice okay um which is there that's it squared and we've got three lots of this so we write it out three times so that's cubed and then what we do is we multiply them together and that gets us moles per decimeters cubed to the power of five okay which is there and then if we break all this down open this up expand this bracket effectively we get mole 5 dm to the minus 15 so it's all in moles per decimeters cubed because this is measuring concentration remember okay so ksp can be calculated using the solubility value okay remember that's what we looked at just before there so let's have a look at this example so calculate the solubility product of li2co3 so it's a lithium carbonate when the solubility of this is 13.3 grams per decimeters cubed and this is going to be done at 20 degrees celsius okay so it's at a specified temperature so first of all we write the ksp expression okay so the reaction is lithium carbonate which is li2co3 this breaks to form two lithium ions lithium plus ions and a carbonate ion which is co3 2 minus so our ksp expression is going to be whoops okay is going to be lithium plus squared because we've got two of them and then carbonate remember to include your state symbols they're both aqueous okay so then what we need to do is we need to calculate the solubility of lithium carbonate in moles per decimeters cubed. So remember, we've been given it in grams per decimeters cubed. So to do that, we do the solubility um, in moles per decimeters cubed is what it is in grams per decimeters cubed divided by the MR. So the MR of lithium carbonate is 74. So remember, you use your periodic table to get that. Um, so it's 13.3 divided by 74 
gives you a solubility of 0.18 um, moles per decimeters cubed for this substance. Okay, so the next thing we need to do is we know that one mole of lithium carbonate dissociates to produce two moles of lithium and one mole of carbonate ions at equilibrium. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to take this value here and we need to multiply that by two to find out the concentration of lithium ions. So that's two times 0.18 which is 0.36, and then obviously the concentration of carbonate is a one-to-one -one ratio, so we just have 0.18 moles per decimeter cubed of carbonate. And so the next thing we need to do is then work out the value of Ksp. So we just bring in our expression back again. We put the numbers in, as you can see there. Remember to square it there for that one, and then we get the value of Ksp to be 0 0.023. Okay. Now, critically, we've got to be able to work out the units as well. So remember, we just put all our uh, units in for concentration. So we've got moles per decimeters cubed squared multiplied by moles per decimeters cubed. That's going to get as moles per decimeters cubed cubed, which is on there. We expand that bracket and we get mole 3 dm to the minus 9. And that is the value of our KSP. So that's the units there. And obviously the units would go onto the end there. Okay. So that's it. So that's everything you need to know for the energetic side for the oceans topic for OCRB salters. Um, there's a lot of information in there, as you can see, a lot of calculations. So if you're ever stuck, just go through it again. Um, I've done a full range of videos for salters year one and year two. They are dedicated to the salter specification on Alloy Chemistry YouTube channel. There's also whiteboard tutorials on there, which are useful for general information. They're all for free. All I ask, remember, is to hit the subscribe button as well. Um, and if you, these slides here, if you want to have a copy of them, you can purchase them in the link below. The great value for money. You can use them on the move. You can use them, um, you know, on your smartphone, your tablet. I've known people to print them off as well as notes. So go and have a look at them there. Um, they're all there for you. Okay, that's it. Bye-bye.